Hi everyone, welcome to part two of my Apple stock analysis. We're gonna continue where we left off in part one. So to recap, in part one, we figured out what a stock is, uh, where to find the 10 Qs and 10 K filings on SEC website. And we started building our uh, free cash flow model. So my goal today is to finish the model. And to recap why we're building the model, um, if you recall in part one, we talked about how a stock um, is a, a stock is a future cash flow discounting mechanism. And while that's a kind of a, a subjective concept because the future is uncertain, so nobody knows with certainty how much cash a company can generate. But the best, one of the best predictor or indication of future cash generation for a company is really the track record um, of historical cash generation, right? Otherwise, if I told you to predict Apple's future, like how much cash can they generate in the future, you would probably look at their their past, you know, past performance because that's probably a good predictor. So um, well, I'm going to dive right in. So this is where we left off with uh, net operating profit after tax. Let's pull up our uh, our filings. Um, so I'm looking at Q2 2020, uh, 10Q. We're gonna. A move away from the income statement where we spent most of our time last session and go down to the consolidated consolidated statement of cash flows or in short cash flow statement and skip to the uh the investing activity section and we're going to look for um what's called capital expenditure capex and here they called it payment for acquisition of property plant and equipment or capex the same thing so the first adjustment we're going to make to net operating profit is capex okay so because we're interested in um, cash flows if you think about if you think about a company let's think you know not even apple let's think about an airline right so once in a while they have to make these massive um, investments to like buy new planes right and those planes they last for 20 years or something so um so in accounting, when, when they make these, you know, investments in uh, assets like, you know, planes or computers or servers, um, they do what's called they capitalize it instead of they expense it. And the reason why they do that is because if you think about it, if you if like an airline expensed a airplane every time they bought every time they need to buy an airplane, then the incomes like the incomes and then they put as like operating expense, then um then their performance will look very weird, right? Like one quarter, they're gonna be making money and the next quarter, it's gonna look like they have a massive loss because they bought a few airplanes. But really those planes are like an investment that you can use in the future. Um, so it's not really fair to like, you know, expense all that cost in, in that one quarter if the plane can be used for like 20 years. So that's why in accounting, they will um, capitalize it. Um, uh, but since we're interested in cash flows, like that's a cash flow out the door in the current quarter. So uh, we want to capture that. So it looks like in the nine month um, end of June 27th. So another nuance with the cash flow statement is like it's presented in a different way than the income statement. You know how I remember in the income statement, it's like every three months you know they'll they'll record it but the cash flow it's like it's like a rolling record over the fiscal year so in the first three months it's three months and the next three months it's actually the six months before and then next three is actually nine months and so on so it's uh it's a rolling record it's not really um in three month increments so it looks like they spent about 5.5 billion in for the nine months ended June. Because of that, we have to build a formula. Oops. Subtract out the two months prior, right? Or the two quarters prior. And then let's see, what do they do in Q2 of 7718? Okay, so related to the capital expenditure I just talked about on the flip side, there's, um, there's something called depreciation expense, um, which, which is in the operating activity section. Okay. So, um, 
remember those like remember let's just use the plane example uh, remember the plane that we that accounting capitalized well the cost um, because we didn't you know expense the cost in that quarter the cost gets spread out over a long period of time so that cost you know it's rolled into the operating expense like for years to come right so some a little bit of it will show up in the three month here um, so that expense if you think about it it's not a cash expense because they've paid for the playing like years ago right and then now there is just an accounting adjustment to reduce the value of that playing on the accounting record so it's not like there's cash out the door it's just an accounting adjustment so because it's not a cash out the door we want to add that back right we want to add it back to earnings because that's already being um they've they've penalized us for it in sometimes in COGS and in R&D and SG&A, like there's a depreciation component in here that's not really cash out the door, okay? So I'm gonna type here depreciation and it's a three, five, four minus the two quarters prior. Okay, the third adjustment we're gonna make is called um, working capital adjustment. So this is a little bit more like advanced uh, conceptually. So if you think about it, like um, it looks like, let's say the, op the um, operating profit after tax here, right? It's like 11 billion. Um, wow, that's like really good. But what if just, you know, thought experiment, uh, what if, you know, the, um, like the the sales and stuff like the customer is not gonna pay like let's say you had an iphone and you don't have to pay for that iphone for um until 2022 like in two years so apple doesn't actually get the cash until 2022 but they've recorded it as a sale right so you really should like adjust for um stuff like that because because it's like they won't get the cash until like much later, for example, but you've given them credit for it here. So you, you should really adjust for that kind of stuff. And um, it's more, it's actually more a little more complex than that, but that's kind of for as an in first introduction to working capital, it's like think about it as um, like accounts payable and accounts receivable, like the timing of those, right? That you want to adjust for. So we'll call it working change in working capital. And this shows up on um, the cash flow statement under changes in operating assets and liabilities. Operating assets and liabilities is like work, is basically working capital. So um, here they have broken it out for us. We actually just need the sum. So like, unfortunately, we have to type all this in just to get to the the sum, which is kind of annoying. But it is what it is. Oh, there they are. Oops. AP. Deferred revenue and other current Okay, so working capital change working capital is the sum of all of these guys. That's also for uh, that's also for nine months, so we have to do the formula.
Okay. So it looks like um, their change in working capital was positive 1.823 billion for the nine months. So that's actually a good thing, right? Because a positive number means like a cash flow in, in this instance. Um, so that's actually a good thing. Let's do the same for this. I always forget. Yeah, so this part is pretty time consuming because of how they, you know, the, the way they present it is, is not ideal for transcribing to a spreadsheet. All right. Okay, so let's, we've got our adjustments here. So let's start, um, I'm gonna collapse this because it's gonna kinda get in the way. So let's start adjusting our, our notepad, okay? So um, remember last time, so we ended with a notepad of 11, 207, right? So remember they spent money buying like new equipment, okay? So minus that, and then, but um, we get money, we get cash back because of the depreciation, the, the non-cash expense, right? So you add that back. And then you also want to add the change in working capital. All right. So this is what's called unlevered free cash flow. So we're almost there. Okay, we're just one step away from getting the free cash flow. And... Uh, remember that that these numbers aren't really right because we have to fill these in in order to um, to really know what they were for the three months, right? So let's do that right now. So we need to go to the 10 Q before. Five six oh two. Remember, it says now it says six month. Okay, so you just have to subtract the quarter before, and you can see that once you back out right the one before, then you know that for 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 Q two is the depreciation expense is just two point seven billion and three point nine six. working capital
Yeah, I realize I'm going pretty fast, so let me know if you have like questions by commenting. All right, so we got Q1 out the way. Let's do this one. So this is my favorite because I don't have to do any formulas. It's already, it's just three months. Depreciation 2816. 3395. CapEx. Two one oh seven three three five five working capital two one eight five Okay, we got one more quarter to fill using a 10K. Okay, cash flow statement, depreciation. Cool. All right, we're finally done filling this stuff in. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So um, it looks like Apple is generating cash every single quarter. You know, 12 billion in the last quarter, 10 before. 26.8 right and you might be like why is this so like different so lumpy right why is this so much higher in q4 well first of all it's holiday season but also they're helped by the working capital right so it's a big positive four billion here um to me that that, that means like you know they're getting the cash in the in the door um faster than they have to pay for the cash for, for the, they have to pay their supplier so that's like a pretty good thing um, looks like this pattern kind of holds right in Q4 is their big cash flow generation season. Um, Q3 is pretty good too. That's probably when Q3 is not bad either. So 
you might be wondering why what is unlevered free cash flow um wh why is it unlevered why isn't it just free cash flow so it really it's it's really simple so unlevered just means it's not accounting for um leverage which is debt so it's not um taking out like interest expense um so to get from unlevered to just normal like free cash flow all we have to do is adjust for interest expense okay and that's back in on the income statement so that's the last thing we have to adjust for so interestingly for apple um they don't break out their interest expense they, I think they group it, they, they include it in what's called other income and expense. Um, some company, a lot of companies will break that out for you. But I mean, for the sake, it's such a small number for the sake of like $46 million doesn't move the needle, even 300 doesn't, right? So let's, for the sake of simplicity, let's just pretend, or let's just say this is their interest expense, right? Or we can just say interest expense slash other, other expense income, right? So in this case, they had a, sorry, I don't want bold, 46 367 Two A two three seventy eight. Last one, other income expense, 1807, but remember that's for the full year. So we subtract out the three quarters prior. So let's calculate their free cash flow. Okay, so we have Apple's free cash flow after adjusting for um, for leverage okay so it's a little bit higher right because they, they actually have like interest income and other income um, so it's actually increases their free cash flow and then I'm also gonna remember these are like for three months right so I'm also gonna do what's called free cash flow trailing 12 months so this gives us like the, the trailing one year free cash flow, it's much um, it's a little more informing to look at like how much cash they generated in one year because like I said, you know, there's like quarters that they generate more and less. So it's more, um, it's more standardized to look at like a trailing one year figure. And I'm only, I'm only gonna go to here, right? Because if, because I've only got data up to 2018 Q4. Uh, if I was doing this for real, I will probably go out at least three years, but for the sake of, you know, time, just gonna go out um, about seven quarters. 
Okay, so great. Like now we know Apple generates a ton of cash, sixty-five billion um, on a trailing twelve-month basis. So what what does that mean? Why do we why why do we care? Is that is it a good deal? Does that mean like I should buy Apple at one fifteen? Um, there's one more step, and that's figuring out um, what's called the enterprise value of Apple and comparing to how much cash they generate. Okay, so knowing how much cash they generate is great, but you kind of have to um, figure out what what the market is, thinks Apple is worth, right? So um, I'm gonna start a new tab here. Tab just hit sheet two, okay, and the first number. that most people are familiar with is market cap. Okay, so market cap is basically what the stock market, what the equity market thinks Apple is worth, okay? Um, and market cap, the definition of market cap is shares outstanding times price per share right so this is how many uh, when you buy remember when you buy a share of Apple you buy a little piece of Apple so how many little pieces of pie are out there shares outstanding and the price per share so price per share really easy to find today it's 115 all right let's just call it 115 per share and shares outstanding it's also easy to find um, shares outstanding is on you want to use the latest, so you want to use the latest from, uh, in this case, it's Q2 2020, and it's right here. Um, it says there is shares used in computing EPS, 4.3, okay? And here's a tricky thing. So everything is in millions except for a number of shares, which are in thousands, okay? And I don't know why, but... So you got to divide this by a thousand to keep everything in the same units. So four, three, one, two, point six. But here's something that um, is not going to come up very often. But remember how Apple um, recently they did a stock split, and that's after they released their uh, Q2 earnings. Okay. So it used to be that. Um, let's see. We have to see. Apple stock split 2020. Okay, so Apple, um, so after they released their this thing in, in June, right, in July, they did an Apple stock split in August, and one share of Apple um, back then is now worth four shares of Apple today. So this doesn't come up very often, but we have to adjust for that because because you basically one old share is worth four new shares. So you have, to, but we're still looking at old shares because all the statements are in old shares. So you gotta multiply by four, okay? And then we'll like put a footnote, old shares, um, old shares one to four stock split. All right. So remember, so market cap, price per share times number of shares. So market cap um, is $1.9 trillion, okay? And just a sandy check, we can always like go to Google, right? Google Finance. And here it estimates that the market cap to be 2 trillion. Yeah, pretty close, 1.92. So I think, you know, we, we got this right. Um, so let's move this down. So market cap. Okay, here's what you probably don't know. Um, market cap is not the full picture. You also have to adjust for for some things to get to what's called enterprise value. And you might ask, um, why why do we do that? Isn't market cap what the company is worth? Um, yes and no. So if you think about, uh, I'll give you an ex extreme example. Um, there's a car rental company out there called Hertz, right? And their market cap is like really low. Let's just, I don't know what it is, but let's say it's like $100 million. 
and um, and you're like, wow, this is such a great deal. I can buy Hertz for a hundred million dollars. They're even if I sell their cars, like you know, that's like I can I can easily pay that off, and then the company still has value. But what you're not taking into account is is the debt, okay? Because um, you won't see a single penny of that as a stockholder until the debt the debt holders are paid. So once you account for debt, then and then you account for the debt on Hertz, then it's like Hertz is actually a, like maybe like a ten billion enterprise value, um, and not you know just a hundred million, right? So um, you really have to um, account for the debt um, in order to get a full picture of what the market is pricing the company at. So with Apple, um, we talked about you have to account for debt and then you also have to subtract, subtract out the cash. And for the exact opposite reason as debt, um, cash, you really want, you want to give companies credit for cash, right? Cause, because, um, if they, if Apple has like a ton of cash, um, you, you don't want to be penalizing them for, for that cash because that cash is, you know, immediately available to you. If you buy the company, you, you know, you can, you can just, um, you can get rid of the cash and you, you can pay it out as dividends and stuff like that. So, um, let's do that. I probably didn't explain that, um, as well as I should, because I'm really tired, but, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll do better next time. So the debt is found on, on the balance sheet. Okay. So there's two debt that's like maturing in under a year is called short term debt. It's under current liabilities. Um, here we have commercial paper and repo agreements. Is this Apple? Why do they have that? Okay, whatever. So debt, there's short term and long term. I'm just going to add them all together. Cause I don't really care. So one, 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 six, six commercial paper is debt. Okay. Um, you just kind of have to know seven, five, oh, nine. That's their short term debt. Plus what do they got in long term term debt, non-current long term ninety four zero four eight. So $112 billion of debt. And let's see how much cash they have because we want to give them because ca having cash is a reduction in the enterprise value, which is a good thing. So cash 33, three, eight, three marketable securities. Um, that's like, so companies like they want to earn it. They, if they have a lot of cash, like Apple, they want to earn some kind of, some kind of interest on it, even if it's very low. So they'll put it in what's called marketable securities. That's like, like really short term, like safe investments that they'll earn a little bit of money on, but they can't, you know, it's technically not cash because it's like an investment, but it's very liquid and you can convert that to cash like anytime. So it's also cash to me. Um, let's see what they have in non-current. Let's see if they have any cash here. Okay. They also do, right? So they have something. And they have non-current marketable securities. So that's like longer than one year. Um, that's like a little bit longer term investments, right? Cause companies like Apple with a lot of cash, they want to, they want to earn some money on it. So, so now we see that their cash is actually higher than their debt. And that explains why, um, on the, uh, on the income statement, they have like interest income, right? Because, because they have so much cash. So, so enterprise value is your market cap, um, add it, adding your debt and subtracting your cash. So their enterprise value is actually lower than their market cap because we're giving them credit for the amount of cash they have on their, on their balance sheet. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're on, we're in the home stretch final step here. This is kind of where it all ties together. We're going to calculate what's called enterprise value over free cash flow. This metric. And I'm going to explain um, th what this means in the next video. 
but let's just calculate it so we can complete the model. Okay, so, so here I've calculated the enterprise value over free cash flow 29 times in Q2. It's been trending downwards, okay? Um, and that's all we're gonna do today. It's a pretty long video. Um, and in the next one, I'm gonna explain kind of how to interpret this number and what it means.